Good morning. I, I want to thank you once again for, for letting me uh, be here. These weekends always go by so fast, and it's just been an amazing time together. And just to quickly uh, uh, review a little bit what I felt like God put in my heart uh, we, uh, this, was this theme of, of together for God's glory, that God's glory and His grace, uh, God's glory in His church. And this morning, I want to talk to you about God's glory in His mission. And whether you realize it or not is that you have a mission, that God has given you a mission. The big idea is that we uh, follow him. So um, I, I have this scenario with, I don't know if any dog owners in the house, any dog owners? Oh, yeah. Okay. So we, had, we got a dog a few years ago. And, um, you, know, we're, I'm, you know, oftentimes I'll, I'll walk, you know, Rach and I, my wife will walk this dog. Uh, and what'll happen is they'll see a squirrel or a rabbit and it'll want to like dart off. And, it, and it's just yanking and yanking and yanking on this chain or on the rope, I should say, not the chain. Uh, we don't do, you're like, dude, that's a little, I don't think I like this guy. He's putting chains on dogs. Um, leash. And there, this dog is pulling and pulling and pulling. I don't know if you have this moment, but you have, you know, Rachel and I will say like, are we walking the dog or is the dog walking us. Now, let me just say this. I don't want any emails on how to train a dog. Like I, <laughs> I parented three kids and I'm done. I just want to exist. But so you have these moments where you're thinking like, am I walking the dog? Is the dog walking me? And I want to ask you that question. Are, are you following Jesus into his mission or are you trying to get Jesus to follow you into yours? He has a mission for your life. The call of Jesus is to deny yourself, to deny your dreams, your ambitions, your sense of this is what I want, and to lay that down, to pick up your cross, and to follow him, which is a way, way better mission. Uh, so we have this mission that we're on. And uh, like Danny said uh, a couple nights ago, is we know what this is. I know what it is. Why don't I do it? Well, we have, uh, there's three enemies of spiritual life, the world, the flesh, the devil. And he talked a lot about the world systems are against us. They are shaping and molding the way that we think. And we have our flesh. It just doesn't want to do it. Well, the flesh just does what the flesh wants to do. The flesh wants relief. Um, and we have a third uh, spiritual enemy, the devil. The Bible says that we are in a battle. It's a battle we can't see, but it's a battle that we, in fact, experience. It's not flesh and blood. Our battle is not against flesh and blood, but it's against principalities and powers, against demonic forces um, behind all the pain and suffering, big and small. It's a battle that uh, New Testament writers, particularly Paul, says, I don't want you to be unaware of, the, of this battle. I don't want you to be unaware of the schemes of the enemy, lest we be outwitted by him. But make no mistake, the enemy of our soul wants to steal from you, wants to take from you, and wants to destroy what you have. And it's been my experience that church folk just let him have it. What is he after? He's not after your health. He's not after your money. He's not after the things that you think he's after. What he is after, he is after your influence. He is after the purpose and plans of God that you have been ordained to walk. And you see the full picture of our salvation is that God saves us from something. So Ephesians 2.10, that we were dead in our sins and he made us alive in Christ. He has saved us from our sin, but he has saved us to something. He has saved us to good works but that he has prepared for us before the foundation of the world. That you and I, that we, it says that we are his masterpiece, right? And that word masterpiece has the, this, this language of like poetry, this, this work of art. You know, I, I don't do a lot of poetry. I've written a few rap songs, but not a lot of poetry. And, 
But the idea is that God, that we are his, that we are a work of art, that we are uniquely who we are. There's never been anyone like us and there'll never be anyone like us. And he has a purpose and a plan for that. Have you ever asked yourself, why am I this way? Why am I this way? I don't understand. I don't like the way I am. Why am I this way? I just want to encourage you. God wants to show you exactly why you are that way. And it has a redemptive purpose. It's about your influence. And this is what God wants to do. This is seen in the narrative of Israel being saved from Egypt to the promised land. God has a, God has a place, a promise for you. Uh, he wants to do more in your life than just address your past but he has a present and a future as well. Jeremiah says that it's plans. He has good plans for you. And that is what the enemy is after. He is after that. Another way of saying it is that he is after your territory. So listen, when he fights you, when he fights you, it's not about you. It's about the promises that God has for you. It is about the territory that God wants you to possess, live in, and enjoy. And so there is a series of events in the life of Jesus that we often view as separate. I have anyway. It's found in Mark 4 and 5, as well as uh, Matthew 8. And I'm going to uh, jump back and forth. But if you want to write this, those down, you can go read the story for yourself later. Uh, Mark adds things that Matthew doesn't and vice versa. And it illustrates these three stories, these three scenes illustrate that the fight that we're, uh, that they we're in and the narrative begins with an invitation from Jesus and it ends with a showdown with demonic forces. And in the middle is this great storm so great that if you were to experience it, you would think that you were going to die. So we're going to look at these stories. Uh, we don't have to fear but we do have to be aware. We have nothing to fear, but we do need to be aware. So how does the enemy work in your life? Number one, he distracts you at the very beginning. He distracts you from getting in the boat in the first place. So Matthew 8, 18 through 22. Now Jesus, when he saw the crowd, he gave orders to go over to the other side. He gave orders. He commanded. So like, don't lie, don't cheat, don't steal. This is an order. This is a command. And then all these people said, you know, hey, I'd love to join you, but I've got, you know, I've got this, you know, oxen to take care of. I got this house to take care of. I got to go bury my father. And Jesus is like, leave, uh, you know, leave that to someone else. You need to follow me. But I just want to say, uh, and this is a group of disciples. So he calling his gr group of disciples. Hey, I want you to come in the boat. I'm going somewhere. I'm going to take you on a mission. I'm going to the other side of the lake. I want you to come with me. And one by one, people says, not me, not me, not me. For this reason, for this reason, for this reason. And just because you call yourself a Christian doesn't mean that you're in the boat. Just because you're in church doesn't mean you're in the boat. These are people that Matthew calls disciples. They were very warm to Jesus, but they let other distractions take center stage. The first, the first thing the enemy will do in your life will is distract you from the central purpose of your life. Well, how do you know if you're, if you're in the boat? How do you know that you're tracking with him? Well, you're doing what he says to do. In Luke 8, he says, my mother and my brothers are those who hear the word of God and do it. And here's true. Every, if you track every encounter with God throughout the Bible, Genesis, Revelation, it always leads to mission with God. Every time. So, so Moses encounters God at the burning bush. And it wasn't just for like, oh man, wasn't that a great encounter? Didn't we just have a great weekend together? I want you to go do something. I, I, got, I got a plan and purpose for your life. It is, I want you to release my people. I want to go show Egypt how strong I am, how powerful I am. And what God doesn't do, he doesn't show up and say, hey, come on, guys, we're getting out of here. He sends Moses to go do it. Encounter with God leads to mission with God. Isaiah, this has been mentioned like several times. I think I've mentioned it several times so far this weekend. He comes into the presence of God and he leaves the presence of God and saying, here I am, send me. He come, we, you see, you and I come to God's presence wanting him to be available to us, but we leave God's presence wanting to be available to him. 
That is the way it works. It works every single time there is an encounter with the living God. It leads to mission with God. So expect him to send you. When you encounter God's presence, expect him to send you. I love what it says in Habakkuk uh, 2. It says he, he waited at the watch post to hear what God would say to me. And I just see a group of people who just love revelation from God. God, what do you want to say to me? And then the next line is he says, now Habakkuk, write it down, write it down on stone tablets, make it clear, why? So everyone who reads it will run after it to do it. God wants to reveal things to you so that you would run after him. So what happens when we get in the boat? Storms come, storms come. Just here to encourage you guys, that's all. That's what I'm here for, just to... Build you up. You're welcome. You're welcome. So when he got in the boat, the disciples followed him, that is the 12, and behold, there arose a great storm on the sea, so the boat was being swamped by the waves, but he was asleep. And they went to woke him up, saying, Save us, Lord, we are perishing. And he said to them, Why are you afraid? Oh, you have little faith. That's interesting. Then he rose and rebuked the winds of the sea, and there was a great calm. And the men marveled, saying, what sort of man is this that even the winds obey him? The boat is being, sw this is a legit storm. Like, this isn't like hyperbole. This is like, they thought, these were experienced fishermen who, who live in the sea, and they're like, this storm is for real. This is gonna over, it wasn't like they just went out and like they'd never done this before. They knew what they were doing and they thought they were gonna die in this. This was a legit storm and you have legit issues in your life. I have legit issues. I mean, just the, I mean, the pain that people experience in their life is overwhelming. It is just overwhelming. I um, recently just, I sat in the, I got, a call from some members in our church, some great young couple. And uh, they called me up to the hospital, please come quickly. Um, our, ba our little baby, 11 month old baby is, uh, it doesn't look good. By the time I get there, she had already passed. I'm sitting in the hospital, we're praying, God, you know, bring life to this child, bring life to this child, bring life to this child. And as passionately as we prayed, it. it this baby passed. I mean, this couple is experiencing a storm. This isn't like, like, oh, you had a bad day, you know, like you, 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 know, you didn't like your lunch. I mean, we're talking about real painful issues. What does God do in these storms? He sleeps. That's a little insensitive. We worry. He sleeps. Disciples see Jesus sleeping and they conclude he doesn't care. If you cared, Jesus, you would do something about it. In Mark's version, he says, don't you care that we are perishing? When storms come in our life, the thing that we want is we want the storm to end. And, who, and I want the storm to end. But what does Jesus do? Before he rebukes the storm, he rebukes the disciples. Before he rebukes us, not for disturbing Jesus with their prayers, but for disturbing themselves with their fears. We want Jesus to get rid of the storm. Jesus wants to get rid of our doubt. He said, Paul tells young Timothy, I've not given you a spirit a fear. God has not given you a spirit of fear, but of love and a sound mind. Often Jesus will address us before he addresses the storm. Uh, we see this in the father who had a demoniac son. You remember that story where the disciples, they go out, they try to do it, they can't do it. And, you know, like, um, um, you know, the, the father comes to, hey, your, I, your disciples, I went to your church your disciples said that they could cast him out. They tried to cast him out and it didn't work. And so Jesus comes on the scene. So in Mark 9, 20, it says, they brought the boy to him. And when the spirit saw him, immediately it convulsed the boy and he fell on the ground and rolled about foaming out the mouth. 
I mean, this demon was not playing. I mean, he had the audacity to do this right in front of Jesus. So it's one thing to do it in front of the disciples, right? But when I'm, when I'm reading this, I'm like, oh my gosh, these demons don't know what they're doing. I mean, they did it right. And, and Jesus is just going to go off. He is going to, like, you don't get in the octagon with Jesus. Like, you, it's not going to go well. But bless my soul, Jesus turned, he sees this boy foaming at the mouth, convulsing. The, the, the Bible says, the scripture says that he turns his face away from the boy and locks eyes with the father. He turns his attention from the pain and the problem to address the father. And he begins to ask the father question. While this boy is convulsing and foaming at the mouth, he starts to have a little pastoral conversation about past hurts and pains. Hey, Jesus, can we, can we do the conversation later? Can we take care of the problem? And then, you know, we can, we can go out for coffee. We can do whatever you want. Before he deals with the pain, he deals with the person. And what he wants to address here is faith. He addresses us before he addresses our pain. He loves us too much. Maybe you've been in pain and you're wondering, why doesn't Jesus do anything about it? He, he must not love me. He must not care. He must not be good. Beloved, I just want to warn you. I want to warn you of something. I want to warn you that the devil is an opportunist. The devil needs an opportunity. He needs access. And your pain is an access point for the enemy working on you, working on you, working on you. Ephesians 4 says this, in your anger, do not sin. Do not let the sun go down while you're still angry and do not give. He doesn't take it. We give the devil a foothold. And that word foothold is a military word that means base of operations. That when in your pain, in your hurt, when it, when it, when it doesn't lead to faith, it, it, it gives the enemy a, a portal to launch attack after attack after attack after attack. Experts on deliverance ministry call this a double trauma. They call it a double trauma because you have the original trauma. Something painful happened to you. Something, an assault you were lied about, a divorce, spiritual abuse, or just something gnarly and painful. Then demonic beings come in at your greatest point of vulnerability and begin to plant lies about your identity in Christ, about your value and self-worth, and about the trustworthiness of God's love or other people. He is called the accuser of, a, of the brethren for a reason. He accuses them all day and all night. God doesn't love you. He doesn't care about you. He's got something better holding behind his back that he will not give to you. He is not to be trusted. He is not to be loved. Disciples thought that in the storms. But what do we know about Jesus? Well, David, who um, experienced some rough times, he came to the conclusion, actually, you keep track of all my sorrows. You have collected all my tears in your bottle and you have recorded each and every single one of them in your book. And then he went to the cross and he became a bloody mess just to prove once and for all how much he loves you. Settle today, my brothers and sisters, no matter what happens in your life, that he loves you, he loves you, he loves you. For 1 John 4 says this. He says that we have come to know and believe that God loves us. Sometimes you read that, you're like, duh. You know, that's like, it's his job. It's what he's supposed to do. But how powerful that is, especially when you're struggling. To come to know, to know, to know, to know, to know, and to believe that God loves you. And then he goes on and talks about how we have confidence. Even when the day draw near, there's opposition. This is 1 John 4. He wants to perfect his love in us. So big. Spiritual warfare. 
Spiritual, what is spiritual warfare? Believing and knowing that God loves you. That's spiritual warfare. But there's something bigger in your life that he wants to address before he addresses the pain and the hurt. He wants to restore faith. And Jesus gets through because check out the change in the father in Mark 9. It says, immediately the father of the child cried out and said, I believe, but help my unbelief. I believe, help my unbelief. And that's all God needs, by the way. The faith of a mustard seed can move a mountain. I was joking with Reese. I was like, man, like when you asked me what I wanted prayer for yesterday, I wanted your mountains like back in Missouri because we don't have this. And I was like, I just need to find somebody at this conference with the faith of mustard seed so they can move that mountain for me. Anyway, so I don't know if anybody has it, but if you got it, I'll take it. He can do a lot with a little. God will deal with your pain. And maybe you feel like this father, you know, I believe it, but not really. Know that God is moving towards you. I love this promise in Matthew 12. A, a bruised reed he will not break. A smoldering wick he will not quench. And some of you are, are in, a, in pain right now. And some of the, and, you know, I get it. Like, you know, I'm preaching about the church and, and other like directive words. And you got to be this. And you got to do this. And you're like, oh my gosh, this is, just, I'm in pain. I'm in pain. I can't even hear this because I'm in pain. Does God really care? Does God really, oh, he cares. He's got all your tears numbered. He, he has got them all numbered. Every tear that fell down your cheek, he saw and recorded in his book. And he will, he's not here to snuff you out. He is here to be gentle with you. He is so, so, so gentle. He wants to heal you. Let him heal you today. So the storm obeys, surprise, surprise. And this is where it gets interesting. Mark 5.1, it says, Then they came to the other side of the sea, to the country of the Gerasenes. Jesus stepped foot into a new territory. So the big picture, he says, let's, go, let's leave this Area And I want to take you across the sea into the territory, a new territory. I want to expand the territory. I want you to help me expand the territory. And the moment he steps off the boat into this territory, this wild, hairy, grotesque figure comes running toward him, gets close to Jesus and falls on his feet. In Mark 5, 6, it says, and when he saw Jesus from afar. He ran and fell down before him and crying out with a loud voice, he said, what have you to do with me, Jesus, son of the most high God? I adjure you by God, do not torment me. Now, some have concluded that because he fell down before him and because he declared him to be the son of God, this was an act of worship. In fact, this is how the King James Version translates it. However, as Donald English points out in the Bible Speaks Today commentary on Mark, he says this, knowing the name of someone accurately was believed to give you control over the person since the name stood for the nature of that person. In other words, the demons here were not seeking to worship Jesus. They were seeking to control Jesus. And if he's going to, if demons are going to try to control Jesus, if they have the audacity to try to control Jesus, Maybe, just maybe, he might try to control you. Are you aware of this? They got this man to hide out in tombs. The enemy did not even need to get other people to harm him. The enemy manipulated this man to harm himself. Night and day among the tombs and on the mountains, it says, he was always crying out, cutting himself with stones. And some of you are your own worst enemy. Late at night when no one's watching, you are in your own tomb, cutting yourself up with words. You're such a loser. You'll never amount to anything. Nobody loves you. Nobody will accept you. He'll use your past. He'll use your emotions. He'll use your Enneagram. He'll use all kinds of things. And the reason why it doesn't happen more often is because somebody prayed. In Luke 22, this is like encouraging and unsettling at the same time. Simon, Simon, behold, Satan demanded to have you that he might sift you like wheat, but I prayed for you. It's like, hold on a second, wait a minute. You and the devil are having conversations about me? Yeah. 
Demons know that they cannot, they are no match for Jesus, but they do negotiate. You see this in, in, the, in Job. The devil's like, can I do this? No, can't do that. Can I do this? No, can't do that. How about this? Okay, you can do that, but not this. That's happening. He does this with Job. He does it with Jesus in the wilderness, negotiating with him. Hey, if you do this, I'll do this. He does it with, again, he does it with Peter. Hey, I wanna, I wanna do this with Peter. No, I can't do this, but you can do this. What is he negotiating? What is he negotiating in this story? What are the demons trying to negotiate with Jesus about? It says he begged him earnestly not to send them out of the territory. They're nego he's negotiating over the territory. The demon conceded to being sent out of the man, but he begged earnestly not to be sent out of the territory. You have gone through a storm for a reason. You have been viciously attacked for a reason. And the reason is that you are seeking to possess a territory that has been occupied by the enemies of our God. Another little fun fact. This is the whole, well, I'll get to that later. Never mind. So Jesus goes through the storm to get to this guy and he said, let's go to the other side. Let's expand the territory. And anytime you seek to expand the tour territory, expect a demon to show up somewhere. In the beginning of 2019, man, at Jubilee Church, it was all like high fives and champagne. We, um, not here though, sorry, no champagne here. So we, uh, it was somewhere else, before I was a Christian. And we, uh, Wait a minute, I already said 2009. Anyway, so forget that I said that. It was a good moment. It was a good moment. It was a good moment. And we had just, we had just signed a contract to, for a new, new building. Buildings are always fun to buy. And um, we just announced plans to plant a church uh, across the state over in Kansas City, which is going really well. And things are really going really well. And my dad has this dream. And in this dream, and he sends, it woke him up in the middle of the night, my dad's pretty prophetic. And he, in this dream, he sees this pack of wolves. And over here, he sees a flock of deer. And he sees that the wolves are going after the deer. And so he jump, he, he, he gathers up, he gets into the middle, in between uh, the, the wolves and the, um, the deer. And instinctively, he just kind of knew it was like uh, the enemy and the church. And in this dream, there was kind of a, 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 a female, a, it's a doe, right? Female deer, okay. A deer, a deer, a female, okay, don't, yeah, I get it. Sound of music, help me there. And um, saw this lone female deer, o, doe, over here. And the, and the lead wolf in the dream said, if you do not get out of the way, I'm going after her. And he wakes up. He shares this dream, we're just like, was that supposed to mean? Two weeks later, his wife, my mother, inexplicably, within 48 hours, becomes paralyzed from the neck down in immense amount of pain. The doctors thought she was going to die, and she wanted to die. Um, she, this rare autoimmune thing happened. And um, now she, she recovered. But actually, this is where God spoke to me about these verses. Because what he spoke to me about, because I, I thought the enemy was after my mom. But the enemy wasn't after my mom. The enemy was after my influence. The enemy was after my territory. The enemy was after the call of God on my life and the call of God on my dad's life. He can't have you. You were bought with a price. 
but he can have. He can thwart your influence. He can thwart your effectiveness. He can rob from you the place of promise, the territory that he has marked out for you before the foundations of the earth that you should walk in them. You have an enemy. He's not after you. He's not after your money. He's after your peace. He's not after your health. He's after your joy. He's not after, he's after, he's after what only the kingdom of God will bring you, your righteousness, your peace, and your joy. He's after it and he wants it. John and Kate Payne, where you at? Not after you. He's after your influence. He's after your call. He's not after you. Danny, Vanessa, whatever discouragements come your way, he's not after you. He's after your influence. There's a call on your life, and he wants to take it from you. It's not about you. It's not about you. It's about the territory that God has for you. If you stay where it's comfortable, the enemy will leave you alone. If you get in the boat and cross that sea into this new territory, that's when all hell breaks loose. The enemy's first response is to distract you from getting in the boat. Then he'll send a storm. Because he knows that once you get there, he has to leave. In fact, I'll go deeper than that. I bet you the enemy knew who you were going to be before you did and before you got there. There's some things he did early on in your life to keep you from doing what God wants to do in your life. He sent rejection your way. He sent, re he sent addictions your way. He sent sexual brokenness your way. He went after your kids. He went after your confidence. But here's the point. You are under attack and you're under attack for a reason. And it's not about you. The devil isn't fighting you it's about your territory. Demons were not interested in the man. They conceded that. They were concerned about leaving the territory. Don't make us leave the territory. This blew my mind because all this time my focus has been on me and what the enemy is doing to me and how I needed to protect me and how God, I wanted God to help me until I realized where is my focus? It's me. That's why Jesus said, seek the kingdom first. And all these other things will be added. Not seek me first. He said, pick up your cross, not pick up your mirror. The enemy is trying to do whatever he can do to take your eyes off Jesus and put them on yourself. Jesus wants to take your eyes off yourself and put it on him. And as you fix your eyes on Jesus, you will run this race with endurance. If you don't, you'll get entangled by sin and other things that just slow you down. Don't make it personal. It's, it's not about you. It's about the purpose of God on your life. It's about your shall be. It's about all the things that he wants to do in and through you. It's about, it's about those who are caught up in the kingdom of this world that he wants to bring into the kingdom of our God. It's about being a witness. It's about stepping out into your gifting. It's about making a difference in the life of others. He'll distract you, then he'll scare you, and then he'll terrorize you. And as long as you think it's about you, game, set, match. So in this story, the enemy couldn't stop Jesus. So he said, hey, let's make a deal. I mean, I've enjoyed tacking this man. I've messed him up really, really bad. I've loved messing this guy up. I loved seeing him rejected. I loved seeing him all cut up. I've enjoyed inflicting these wounds, but he is not the point. I'm not interested in the man. I'm interested and the territory. So let's make a deal. I know that you're Lord. I know you got the power, but let me stay in the country. Let me stay 
and the territory. And Jesus inexplicably grants the request. This is the great plot twist in the whole deal. He sends them into the pigs. Which, by the way, I mean, obviously, this is, this is non, uh, this is Gentile territory, right? There's no such thing as an Orthodox pig farmer. Uh, so Jesus is not just crossing a lake, he's crossing cultures. So he sends the demons into the pigs, which is what the demons wanted. They didn't want to leave the territories. Maybe they thought if we can't stop Jesus through the man, maybe we could stop Jesus through the pigs. And seemingly their plan worked because they asked Jesus to leave. The pig farmers in the whole town got irritated. And so they asked Jesus to leave. And I bet, I bet, just like at the cross, the enemy felt like he won. I bet you he puffed out his chest a little bit and I got my way. And it could feel that, it could feel that way in, in your situation. You know, you, you, someone gets sick and you pray for, you know, God to heal this person. There's so much faith and they don't get healed. You go share the gospel and you get ridiculed. You go plant the church and it doesn't work. I'm sitting in there in that hospital room. I showed this earlier. I prayed for this little girl to be healed. So much faith. These parents live with so much promise for this girl. She had, um, she had some birth defects that put her life at risk early on, but they believed God was gonna heal her and God was gonna use her uh, to bring a light to his name. And we prayed in that room, God, you said, you said, you said, you said. Expecting Jesus to heal her. Expecting Jesus to say no to the enemy. You can't have this territory. But he let it happen. Why did he let it happen? So there's this passage in Romans 8 that we like to quote. Romans 8, by the way, has made so many million, Christian millionaires uh, with t-shirts and coffee cups. It's just lash after lash of the goodness of God. No condemnation, you know. For God works out all things for good for those who love him. What's the good? Is it, you know, what doesn't, what doesn't kill you makes you stronger? Don't get bitter, get better. If God says no over here, he's just got something better for you. Let me just help you understand that passage. The good there is not the good, is not about you either. The good in there is about your territory. That God will work out all things for good to get you to walk in the purposes and plans that he has for your life. That's the good. If you don't, you're not living for that good, you're going to have a tough time when things go bad because you'll be expecting the good to be about you. And I think we've already covered the problem with making it about you. I love what Joseph said in Genesis 50. Joseph, remember that guy, coat of many colors? I mean, everywhere he, everywhere where it could have gone good or bad, it always went bad and sometimes worse for him. And at the end of his life, he said, all this has happened. All this has happened for the saving of many lives. That God was not ultimately after my happiness. He was after my usefulness. And this was the purpose for which he, you have been saved from something to something. And this is what the enemy wants to attack in your life individually and collectively. And you may be thinking, which I am too, is like, hey man, I'm happy that the demoniac was set free, but Jesus, we risk our life for this storm. And we ticked off an entire town for one man. I just want you to know, actually, this is something that just kind of 
understanding the Bible. Anytime Jesus went for one person, saved one person, the Samaritan woman, the Ethiopian eunuch, places like that, it was significant. It wasn't about the person. It was about the, the territory. Verse 18 in Mark 5, and as he was getting into the boat, so Jesus like, hey, they told me to leave, I gotta leave. The man who had been possessed with demons. I love that line. He used to be the man who was possessed by demons and now he's known as the man who was possessed by demons. God had done something in his life. That was a great time to say, amen. All right. I just need to know you're not bored. That's all. Just a little, a little feedback would be nice. Um, so the man who had been possessed with demons begged Jesus that he might go with him. So Jesus, here's what's interesting. Before he went to this territory, he's trying to recruit people to get in the boat. Nobody would. This man volunteers to get in the boat. And what does he say? No. Some he says, go. And some he says, stay. Go home to your friends and tell them how much the Lord has done for you and how he has mercy on you. And he went away and began to proclaim in the Decapolis, how much, which is a big area, how much Jesus had done for him. And everyone marveled. Later on, later on, if you read in the gospels, uh, this miracle that Jesus did, he comes back to the Decapolis and there's a Syrophoenician woman and there's the man uh, who is, uh, he, healed, he healed many people. This man had got busy being a witness for the gospel and many people outside the region of, uh, of, the, of Israel began to come to the Lord. My question for you guys is what has God given you that the enemy has sent a storm early in your life to stop you? Some of you are in the tombs, perhaps cutting yourself. I'm not saying that you're possessed by a demon per se, but you're listening to the voice of Satan. And I believe God would want to minister to people. I believe he'd want to minister to people who are going through a storm. I believe he'd want to minister to people going through a storm. Some of you are, are, being, are coming under attack. And uh, at the end of my message, Simon came up to me, my son, and, and shared a little a picture with me because I, I, I um, was talking about at the end, you know, about the message about the church, about how we're to be witnesses. And he shared something with me that uh, helped me to realize that there was something missing in my sermon last night. Will you come up here, Simon, just share that really quickly? Will you just make this guy feel welcomed? So just share the... Should I read it too? Yeah, share the picture first. Okay. Uh, so yeah, last night I felt like I got this really strong but pretty simple picture from God that was just like countless people over and over and over getting like baptized in this really strong sense of like God has called us to be um, holders of this power that can save like countless people. And like the joy in that was like really strong, brought me to tears and it was like this really awesome moment. And then yeah, after um, that picture, I felt like God directed me towards this time before he like levitates up into the air and um, calls his people and he says, it is not for you to know times or seasons and the father has fixed by his own authority but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you. And you will be my witness in Jerusalem and all of Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. Amen. Amen. So they had a territory. Yeah, 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 yeah. So they had a territory. And last night I was incomplete in saying, go be witnesses. I forgot to tell you that you're going to need some power. I forgot to tell you that. And thanks, Simon, for lovingly correcting me with that. And today, some of you know the territory that God has for you. 
but you just feel inept and the task is too big. And it's supposed to feel that way. It's supposed to feel that way. 120 people. Hey, yeah, here, here's all I want you to do. Just go to the ends of the earth and let everybody know about me. That's all you got to do. He wants to take you to the edge of the cliff so that you can see how impossible it is for you to do it on your own strength. So I believe he wants to fill people with his power to cast out the fear that you have in being a witness. And then lastly, I think there are some people here who have some unclaimed property to possess. Um, it's possible for you to own something but not possess it. I, um, nation, in the United States, there is $66 billion worth of unclaimed property. There's $66 billion worth of land that people own they have yet to possess. This is the, the narrative in the Old Testament. And when they, God had given them the promised land, and then he says, now you have to go possess it. And then they go possess it. And they, he says to them, I'm going to give you the land of the Canaanites. They show up and they're like, oh my gosh, the Canaanites are here. And they back down because of fear. God has given you promised. God has promised you stuff. God has land for you to possess. God has territory for you to possess. God has influence and purpose for your life. And he wants you to claim it. And I want to pray for some of you that you would reach out and claim it. Some of you may not even know what that is. I'm guessing that people are not claiming this property because they don't even know that they have it. But Jeremiah 33 says, call to me, call to me, pray to me, pray, call to me, and I will show you grit, great and hidden things that you have not known. There's, there's unclaimed property that you have. There's possession, there's territory, there's influence, there's the promises of God over your life that I think he wants to reveal to you today. So here I want you to, I want to pray for people. You can go ahead and stand. So number one, are you being distracted? Receive prayer. Are there storms in your life? Are you feeling under attack and it's causing you to fear? How do you know you're being attacked by the enemy? Is you're afraid. Let God fill you with his spirit. Let him fill you again. Let him flood him with your presence. It's something we do again and again and again and again and again and again. Boldness, boldness and boldness. And then finally, just fourthly, and I don't even know that I, I don't know what I own. You own something. I don't know what it is. You own something. God wants to tell you about it so that you'll cross over with him through the adversity of life to step into that territory that the enemy wants to take from you. Father, I just thank you for the inheritance that we have in you. That God, you have given us everything we need for life and godliness. And you're not just, God, it'd be amazing that you would take away our past our sin, the penalty the, of against it. Oh, that would be, oh, in some ways, enough, more than enough. But God, ultimately, ultimately, this isn't about the fact that we have been wrong and we've sinned, but we have failed to trust your purpose for our life. We have bought in to a lack mindset. And God, you have a place for us, that you have a purpose and a plan for us. So God, I just, I just pray for my brothers and sisters going through storms, living under fear, uh, unclaimed property, distracted by the cares of this world. God, I pray, would you meet us this morning as we pray for one another in your name, amen.